tribe, tongue, people, and nation. These are human beings. And you have made us kings and priests. That was the promise to Israel of old. Kings and priests, they're sitting on the thrones. They are judging, and we will reign on the earth. And I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Same thing Daniel saw back in Daniel chapter 7. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. They just, they're just jibber-jaw. They're just talking. You need to give them blessing and blessing and give them power, and, and give them honor. They just, whatever words come out of their mouth, they're like, give it to them. Give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. Give it to Jesus. He is worthy. And every creature which is under heaven. Okay, so now we're outside of the throne room. This isn't just the four living creatures, and this isn't just the 24 elders. It's now verse 13. Every creature which is in heaven and on earth. Well, that's everybody. And under the earth, that's everybody, that's even the dead, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power. There they are again, they're just, whatever they can come up with, be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshiped him who lives forever and ever. When Jesus raised from the dead, he was in the garden, and Mary came and recognized him. She didn't recognize him immediately, but when, Mary's, when Mary heard the word Mary, when Jesus spoke that word with a familiarity, a tender, sympathetic familiarity, Mary immediately recognized, oh, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, he's risen from the dead, and she threw herself at, her, herself at Jesus' feet, and she clasped onto Jesus' feet, and Jesus said, do not detain me. Don't slow me down, Mary. I've not yet ascended to my father. Man, you're here early. This is early Sunday morning. You're up early. You're up early. Don't detain me. I've not yet ascended to my father, but I go to the disciples and tell them I ascend to my father and to their father. And Mary's like, ah! And she runs. And she goes back. And Jesus goes somewhere. This is key. Watch this. Jesus goes to his father. And as Jesus ascends to the Father, and he ascends not just by himself, but with that wave sheaf that we discussed, you might be wondering, what were those that raised from the dead doing? Well, Matthew tells us they were in the city appearing to many. So while Jesus is in the grave, they're appearing. They're telling people, you watch, he's raising. He's going to raise from the dead. And when Jesus came, those, those first fruits would have assembled around Jesus, and they ascend to heaven. And as Jesus begins to make his way into heaven, you can just imagine that the angels were like, whoo here he comes. Here he comes. Victory over the enemy. Victory over death. Victory over sin. Here he comes. And as Jesus is making his way into the precincts of heaven, they wanted to worship, but he said, no, not yet. Don't worship yet. Don't worship yet. What, what, what do you mean don't worship? Don't worship yet. And Jesus made his way into the presence of the Father. He went into the presence of the Father, and he just wanted to know one thing. Is the sacrifice accepted? And in the moment, the Father said, the sacrifice is accepted. And Jesus said, look, I have brought these. I have presented these before you, the first fruits. Jesus said, I'll be back. I'll be right back. And the angels are like, but, but where are you going? You've already been gone for 30 years. Where are you going now? I'll be back in 40 days. Jesus goes back to earth. He was quick too, by the way, because Sunday night he's in the upper room. Sunday night he's in that room in John chapter 20 where the disciples are locked away. <sighs> scared that they're going to be charged with the, with the stealing of the body of Jesus, and Jesus comes down into that room. That was a quick trip. I mean, it's like Sunday morning, he's still on earth. Sunday afternoon, he's up in heaven delivering the first fruits. By Sunday evening, he's back down on earth. That's a quick trip. That's a quick trip. And he comes down, and he, he appears to the disciples, and he breathes on them, and he says, receive the Spirit. And they are like, whoa. And then Mary's like, I told you so, because they didn't believe. I told you. I told you. I saw him. You said not. Not just a hysterical woman. I told you. Look, that's Jesus. That's raised Jesus right there. And so that, now what begins is 40 days of Jesus walking and talking and explaining and spending time and enjoying company and laughing. And it, it was a glorious, amazing, awesome time for 40 days. And the disciples must have thought to themselves, "Woo! Jesus raised from the dead. Others have raised from the dead. It's time now for the kingdom to come. It's time for us to finally and fully conquer the Romans to establish the kingdom of Israel over and above all other competing kingdoms. Woo! And then that 40th day came, and this is described in the book of Acts. Why don't you join me there? 
This is described in the book of Acts. You'll find Acts, that's the fifth book of the New Testament. As we mentioned yesterday, it's one of two post-resurrection gospels. Acts and Revelation operating together as the two post-resurrection gospels. Acts chapter 1, Jesus turns into a helium balloon. <laughs> turns into a helium balloon. Jesus is speaking to his disciples on the 40th day. Acts chapter 1, verse 7, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, yep, and in all Judea, yep, and in Samaria, yep, and to the ends of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they stood, looked steadfastly toward the heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them, white angels, and said, What are you guys looking at? Men of Galilee, why do you stand there gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go up into heaven. They then go to Jerusalem and they wait. Jesus had said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. Look at verse 4 of Acts chapter 1. Being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. John baptized with water, but you're going to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Not many days from now. We're 40 days in. Jesus has died as Passover. He has raised with the first fruits and presented them before God as a promise that even this early harvest is an anticipation of the greater harvest that is yet to come. He ascends to heaven. The angels are ready to worship. He says, I'll be back in 40 days. He goes down, spends 40 days with his disciples, and then he begins to float up like a helium balloon out of their sight. And the angels are like, what are you looking at? Go to Jerusalem and do what he said. Wait for the promise of the Father because didn't he say, John baptized with water. He's going to baptize with fire. Just go wait. You'll see. Just go wait. Just go wait. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost, there it is, number three, the third and final of the spring feasts, when the day of Pentecost had fully come. Why does it say had fully come? Well, because it takes 49 days to get there. Even if you were only three weeks in, it was still the time of Pentecost. If you were four weeks in, it was the time of Pentecost. If you were five weeks in, it was the time of Pentecost. If you were six weeks in, it was the time of Pentecost. But when you were seven weeks in, when you came to that day, that 50th day, that's when the day of Pentecost fully came. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They had put away their, their infighting. They had put away their pride. They had put away their, their, their personal misunderstandings between one another and, their, and th th their ambitions to be the greatest and the best. They had put all of that away. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. Now, keep your finger here in Acts 2. And come with me to one of the weirdest psalms in the Bible. This is a weird psalm. Psalm 133. Come with me to a weird psalm. You might be thinking, why is it weird? You're going to see in just a moment. Psalm 133. Everybody there? Psalm 133. Three verses. Short psalm. Behold, verse 1, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. You know what that sounds like? They were all in one accord in one place. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Isn't that a good thing to be unified with your brothers and sisters in Christ? Behold, uh, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. Verse 2, it is like the precious oil upon the head running down on the beard, the beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. Well, that's weird. Because nothing says unity like an oily beard. Right? Can you imagine if it said, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity, it's like a cluster of grapes. You'd say, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. 
One cluster, lots of grapes, one vine. Yeah, okay, I got it. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like a cluster of grapes. But, but behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like an oily beard. <laughs> Come on, ladies, nothing says unity like an oily beard. <laughs> this wasn't just any beard. The text says Aaron's beard. Aaron was the brother of Moses. Aaron was the high priest. Aaron was the one who represented Jesus. And notice that it says that, that it runs down his beard and, and it drips onto his garment. In fact, there was so much oil. Verse 3, it's like the dew of Hermon coming down the little rivulets down the mountain of Hermon, descending upon the mountains of the Lord into ever-increasing rivers. And there the Lord commanded the blessing eternal life. What's going on here? What's going on here? Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It's like an oily beard and oily garments running down as streams from a mountain. I'll tell you what's happening. Back in the Old Testament, when the sanctuary had been built, the Jewish temple, the Jewish tabernacle, Moses' sanctuary had been built. It, 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 was, like a, it was like a restaurant or a movie theater or, a, or a, 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 a museum that was built, but it wasn't yet operational. You still had to train the people how to make the sandwiches or how to, you know, give the museum tours. So they had it all built, but it wasn't yet operational. And God said, okay, this is all built now. We're going to make it operational. Moses, this is how you make it operational. Take Aaron and dress him up in his priestly garments and bring him in to the tabernacle and take oil. Not just a dribble of oil, not just a drop of oil, not a tablespoon of oil. Take oil and anoint Aaron with oil. Bloop, bloop, bloop. And in the inauguration, in the opening, in the initiation of that temple, the oil ran down Aaron's face, and it ran down Aaron's beard, and there was so much oil, it ran down Aaron's garments, and there was so much oil that it came to the hem of his garment, and there was so much oil that it dripped to the earth. When Jesus said to his disciples, go wait in Jerusalem for a few days, he went back to heaven and Revelation 4 and 5 happened. Revelation 4 and 5, this scene that we've been discussing all night, that happened in those 10 days. When John was invited to come up and take a look and there was the one sitting on the throne with the rainbow and the scroll and the 24 elders and the four creatures and they're all worshiping and then there's weeping because there is the scroll but no one is worthy or able to open it. But then someone is able to open it, a human, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David is worthy to open the scroll and he comes in and he takes the scroll and you might be wondering what that scroll is. That scroll is none other than the very scroll that was placed in the hand of the ancient kings. It's the book of the law, it's the covenant. It's basically the book of Deuteronomy was placed into the hand of kings in the Old Testament. And it was as if to say, you are a king. These are the, the rules and the guidelines and the principles by which you will reign. And there was even a little compartment on the side of the throne so that it would always be near to them and they were to read it and study it every day of their lives. But the truth of the matter is, is that king after king after king after king did not live by what was in that scroll. They weren't worthy to open it. They were disobedient and they had transgressed and they had failed and they had fallen and some of them fell very, very, very far. Even though they were God's people and God's king, God never wanted them to have a king, but they were God's king. God wanted to be their king, but, but they, they were a king, but they weren't worthy to open the scroll. And so when John looks and he sees that scroll in the, in the hand, 
He's like, man, no one can open that. Nobody in this room is worthy to open that. Everybody has failed. All have fallen, for all have fallen and come short of the glory of God. But then he sees the lion of the tribe of Judah. He sees the root of David who comes in and he's been slain. He was so faithful. He was faithful unto death. He loved the Lord his God supremely and he loved his neighbor as himself. He lived in perfect conformity to the covenantal law of God. And he goes and he takes the scroll from the throne and he sits down on the throne. And everybody's like, whoo! And they start to worship. And when they start to worship, this 10-day celebratory inaugurating party, a grand coronation party takes place. Jesus is not only king, he's king priest. He's king priest. And at the culmination of those 10 days, the Holy Spirit is poured over Jesus. The Holy Spirit is poured upon Jesus. And just as with Aaron of old, who symbolized and anticipated this moment, the Holy Spirit ran on to Jesus. He was spirit-filled from the beginning. He was spirit-filled through his life, and it pours and runs down Jesus' beard, and it runs onto Jesus' garments, and it runs down. There's so much Holy Spirit in Jesus. That's what the oil symbolized. It runs down to the very edges of his garments. And then on that 50th day, when they were all in one accord, in one place, Acts chapter 2, verse 2 says, suddenly, something happens right now as if it's been waiting to happen. That oil got right to the edge of the garment of Jesus, the spirit, and then it dripped to the earth. And when it dripped to the earth, the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to preach. They began to preach with great passion and great power. They began to preach with great conviction. And do you want, you want me to tell you? I, I, don't even got, I, don't, I don't have to read it to you. If I had time, I'd read it to you, but I'll tell you, what, I'll tell you what they're preaching. They're saying Jesus is enthroned in heaven. They knew it. They knew it. They, they saw it. They're like, whoa, he's, Jesus is in heaven. And this thing that you see now, this demonstration, as people are beginning to assemble increasingly because they were speaking in tongues and languages and dialects that were not their own, and as people are assembling a larger and larger crowd, and there's so much passion, there's so much conviction because they realize that something has happened in heaven that is now dripping to the earth, and they are then using this manifestation of the Spirit, and they are pointing people to heaven and saying, Jesus is on the throne. Jesus is in heaven. David wrote again and again, about this and David is in the tomb sleeping but Jesus is in heaven Jesus is in heaven the day of Pentecost had fully come and this is why we have every reason to believe that those 24 that are sitting there those 24 that are sitting there in fulfillment of the annual feast of Israel are the first fruits they are the ones that are there as representatives with their white clothes and their crown of life seated, se seated on thrones who are co-reigning with Jesus as kings and as priests. Now, Jesus was coronated as king priest on the day of Pentecost. That's what happened. That's what happened. His heavenly ministry was inaugurated and celebrated. It was a grand celebration that climaxed with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. La Rondelle writes, the intention of John's throne vision is to disclose the beginning of Christ's heavenly ministry and reign because of his enthronement. As the risen Lord, the initiation of a new era of salvation. This is why it's a new song. It's a messianic age. Jesus is the rightful king. We've seen this already several times. Daniel chapter 2, verse 21, he changes the times and seasons. Jesus removes kings and he sets up kings. Lamentations 5, 19, you, O Lord, remain forever. Your throne is from generation to generation to generation. Jesus was standing before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate's like, don't you know who I am? I could kill you right now. Don't talk back to me, boy. Don't you know who I am? And Jesus said to Pilate, you would have no power at all against me if it hadn't been given to you from above. You see, friends, there are thrones on earth. But these thrones, though they have a modicum of power, though they have a whisper of power, though they have, though they have a drop or a drip of power, they do not possess true power. True power is on the throne in heaven. And the coolest thing ever is that the, th the person that is on the throne in heaven is a slain lamb. 
Without Christ, world history would be an enigma without a purpose or without a direction. Jesus said to him, put your sword in its place, for everybody who takes the sword will perish by the sword. And that's the history of the earth. Living by the sword, dying by the sword. Revelation 13, verse 10, he who kills with the sword will be killed by the sword. Bauckham in his book, The Theology of Revelation, says when the slaughtered lamb is seen in the midst of the divine throne, what was it that was seen on the throne? What was seen on the throne was a lamb as if it had been slain. When the slaughtered lamb is seen in the midst of the divine throne, the meaning is that Christ's sacrificial death belongs to the way that God rules the world. He rules by transparency. He rules by humility. He rules by vulnerability. God does not win our allegiance on the strength of his nature, but on the beauty and attractiveness of his character. He wins our loyalty. In Revelation, God's leading adversary, says Sigvit Honstad, is called the great dragon, that ancient serpent, the devil and Satan, that is the deceiver of the whole world. And this disclosure that he is a deceiver explains why you can't bring this guy, you can't win this conflict, you can't bring him to heal by force. The only way you're going to win this conflict is for the deceiver to be unmasked. Well, how are you going to unmask the deceiver? The deceiver must be unmasked, and the task of doing that in Revelation has been accomplished by Jesus in the form of a lamb that looks as if it had been slaughtered. Who invites others to come and sit on their throne? Hey, come sit with me. Come reign with me. Come govern with me. Come rule with me. Who does that? God does. Because God is not a tyrant. God is not a despot. He's not leveraging his power and his omnipotence over other people. That's not God's way. He's not leveraging his power to, to, to demand and to create something in you that is not native and, and voluntary. God invites. He attracts. He woos. He pleads. He begs. He asks, come, come, come sit with me. Colossians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them when he triumphed over them in the cross. What Jesus did on the cross was the total reversion, the total reversal of what power looks like. Because if somebody is nailed to a Roman instrument of torture, it looks like Rome has prevailed. But in this instance, the crucified has prevailed and the, the murderer has actually failed. He disarmed them by his love and by his mercy and by his willingness to do for them. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and the question I suppose for us tonight is, is he your king? And is he your Lord? Don't be afraid of him. He's a lamb. He is a lamb as if it had been slaughtered. He is vulnerable. He is available. He is approachable. He invites you to come. Come up and sit with me on my throne. Come here, come sit here. All of these four living creatures, they don't sit with me on my throne. All of the thousands of, of angels and 10,000 times 10,000, they don't sit with me on my throne. But you, you come, you come. You sit with me on my throne. Jesus is worthy according to Revelation 4 and 5, and he deserves, not demands, your love, your worship, and your life. That's why they take their crowns off. They're like, man, these crowns aren't for us. These crowns are for you. These crowns don't belong to us. These crowns belong to you. These thrones don't belong to us. These thrones belong to you. Final slide tonight. He says to you, he says to me, and he says to the world, please follow me because I love you. That is a king that you can serve. That is a king that you can trust. He is a king who is sufficiently powerful to solve any earthly dilemma or difficulty or kingdom or tyrant, but he doesn't win like that. He doesn't rule like that. He wins by the beauty of his character, and his character is seen in its fullest and most glorious manifestation when he was willing to go to the cross vulnerable. Think of that, God on a cross, God vulnerable, God slaughtered, God wounded, and insofar as it was possible for God to experience death, he did. And then he raised from the dead, and he said, hey, come, come, come sit with me on my throne. Come reign with me. Come rule with me. I am the root of David. I'm a human being now and I am the lion of the tribe of Judah. I am a human being. Come sit with me on my throne, and we will. And then like the 24 elders who are just the first fruits, 
through unending ages, whenever it comes time to worship, we will remove our throne, our crowns, and we will get off of our thrones, and we will place our crowns before him and say, you are worthy, you are worthy. You could open the scroll, and that's what's going to happen. That's what's going to happen in Revelation as we continue. The scroll will be open, and we'll talk about that more. But you were worthy. You alone were worthy. And tonight, Jesus says, please follow me. I love you. I want you in that throne room. I want you to meet those four living creatures. I want you to meet the 24 elders. I want you to be there. I want you to be there. Please follow me. How many of you tonight want to say with me, that's a king not just that I want to serve, but right now I choose to serve. Amen. Amen. Do you want to say with me, Jesus, you are worthy. Jesus, you are worthy. Let's say it together again. Jesus, you are worthy. Father in heaven, tonight, in just a really limited way, Father, we have tried to get our minds wrapped around that throne room scene and father our imaginations are clouded and befuddled and we cannot quite see certainly what john saw but insofar as we were able to tonight we entered by faith into that throne room and we saw you there with a rainbow around you as a symbol that you are a covenant keeping promise keeping god and father we saw redeemed people there, the elders, arrayed in white and seated on thrones with crowns on their heads. And Father, we see in them our future. We see in them our future. And Father, this world is spiraling and spinning out of control and fear has overcome a great many. But I pray that tonight we would heed the words of Jesus in Revelation, do not be afraid. The King of kings and Lord of lords is on the throne. Do not be afraid. Cancer comes, do not be afraid. A tumor comes, do not be afraid. A terrible natural disaster, do not be afraid. A terrorist attack, do not be afraid. A financial collapse, do not be afraid. Marital difficulty, do not be afraid. Loneliness and depression, do not be afraid. The death of a loved one, do not be afraid. Father, tonight we believe that Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and insofar as we are able, we respond tonight with worship and admiration and love, and by your grace, by not being afraid of the future. A new world is coming, a better world, and Father, we wanna be there. We wanna be there, not because we are worthy, but because Jesus is, in whose name we pray, amen. One of the reasons I love the book of Revelation is it's like a treasure hunt. Going through and finding all these wonderful nuggets. When I, when I, I look at the book of Revelation, it says to each one of us, it says, he who has an ear, what? Let him hear. God gives us these messages for us to go through, dig deep, and understand. When I look at Revelation, I think of two words, and they're antonyms. So the, grammatically, this probably doesn't make sense. But when I look at this, I think complex simplicity. All of this that we dig through and look at and see, because God loves you. And each way, each step along the way, when we go through books like Daniel and Revelation, and we dig out these nuggets, we see through all this complexity one simple message, that God loves you and he has a plan for you. Tomorrow night, 6.30, we'll study some more, bring a friend, have a great evening and a safe trip home. Good night. <laughs>